And so what happens is when people become Christians, they, you know, when you go to a foreign country and you try to go, like, say you wanted to go into Brazil, right? And so you're, you're trying to bring fruit and stuff into Brazil and that's a no, no. And so you get, you go through what is called customs. Right. And when you go through customs, what do you have? You have to itemize all your junk. They're going to look over your list. Yes, yes, no, no. And then you throw this away. Sorry, you can't have that. Right. So most Christians get stuck in customs. They get stuck in customs with God. What can I bring? Can't I bring all my sin with me? No, you can bring none of it. Can't I bring this? They get so bum fuzzled about trying to give up stuff and get there. They never leave customs. Right. They're just still trying to figure out what I can get away with. How do I get everything? I want salvation. I want your blessings, but I want my sin. And I want, no, you just have to go, okay, this is God customs into God's kingdom. He says, leave it all behind. That's right. Just drop it. Follow me. I got better things in, in my kingdom. I will give you back the things you give up for me in my kingdom. And then you'll have them forever. Okay. And so we have to, don't, let's not get stuck in customs with God. Let's just go ahead and, you know, drop it all, you know, bring on a carry on with your Bible and then call it good. Okay. Uh, child of uh, children of God, Yahweh, the only God, praise God. There is no other God. And I just want to say this because I just feel like saying that Allah is not a God. Buddha is not a God. There is no other God on the face of the entire planet other than Yahweh. And he has a son, and his name's Jesus Christ, right? He's our Lord and Savior. So if you don't like that, talk to God about it. BrotherLamps.com Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love and many blessings. Thank you for being with us. Give us your Holy Spirit and guide us into all truth. And if there's anybody watching who has not accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, we ask you to uh, come to them in their hearts and minds, open up and call them into your kingdom. And uh, that they'll ask for their forgiveness of their sins and that uh, they will accept you as their Lord and Savior and start reading their Bible. And so uh, bless our Bible studies. Help us have a great day. Bless April's interview. Hope that go well. Uh, thank you for allowing us to be your children and to know the power we have in Christ Jesus. And we love you very much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Awesome. All right. Uh, this is part two, who you are in Jesus. And so we had an inter uh, like a a little intermission last week we might be doing that because this is like four parts so i might be throwing in things as necessary um into the mix so uh either way so who you are in jesus the power of the called part two so it says god jesus holy spirit you and the world it says are you a defeated lifeless spirit drained zombie <laughs> Have you listened so long to the siren song that you have fallen asleep? Or have you awakened or are willing to walk in the power of God? Do you love your sin and rebellion more than you love God? Or will you sacrifice your very life to please the Creator, the Maker King, and the Warrior Christ? So, will you rise to your calling or drown in your sin? And so this is the question every Christian is has to answer every day. Right. Because Paul says, I die daily. Right. And so we have to practice. We have to push forward every single day and make a decision to follow Christ. OK, so we're going to kind of go through some keys here. Uh, the key. And so this kind of recaps what we just read. It says, although you were dead in your offenses and sins in which you formerly lived according to this world's present path, according to the ruler of the minion of the air, the ruler of the spirit that is now energizing the sons of disobedience, among whom all of us uh, also formerly lived our lives in the cravings of our flesh, indulgences and desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature the children in wrath, even as the, as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love, which he loved us, even though we were dead in offenses, made us alive together with Christ, and by grace you were saved. And he raised us up together with him and seated us together with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus to demonstrate in the coming ages the surpassing wealth of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you were saved through faith. This is not for yourselves, uh, from yourselves. It is a gift from God. It is not of works so that no one can boast. For we are his creative work, having been created in Christ Jesus for good works that God prepared beforehand so we can do them. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. Okay. So there's a mouthful. It's a lot there. Uh, Paul's good at doing that. And so what we have is you guys were dead. Jesus, because of God's love for you, he sent Jesus, right, to call you into his kingdom. And because of Jesus, you have a new standing in Christ Jesus in the heavenly realm. 
before God, right? And you're accepted. You did not do this on your own. God did it for you. But I love it because it says, it's. Uh, I love this. It is a gift from God, not by works, so no one can boast. But then right after that, it says, you have been created in Christ Jesus to do good works. So that debate of are you saved by faith or are you saved by works? Well, you were saved by faith. Now you're meant for works, right? And so, and I love the very top of it, that the sons of disobedience. So what is the contrast there? You are a son or a daughter or child of obedience, right? That's the contrast we're getting, okay? So the sons of disobedience, those who don't obey God, they're the bad ones. They're the ones getting the hot place, you know, and then we get the position in Christ Jesus. Amen. So I love it. It's a it's a lot of mouthful, but it's a good lot of doctrine right up front. OK, so we're going to kind of go through a list, a timeline here of where it's going to be Yahweh, Jesus, you and the world. OK, and it's kind of kind of lay out uh, our position in Christ Jesus in, in, in a slightly different way than the first one we did. OK, so uh, everybody ready? Are you doing okay? okay I just make sure you guys weren't having problems over there. <laughs> I saw you guys looking. Okay, so uh, child of uh, children of God, Yahweh, the only God. Praise God. There is no other God, and I just want to say this because I just feel like saying that Allah is not a God, Buddha is not a God. There is no other God on the face of the entire planet other than Yahweh, and He has a son, and His name's Jesus Christ. Right? He's our Lord and Savior. So. If you don't like that, talk to God about it. So, Yahweh, the only God. And he said, Yahweh, the God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath who keeps the covenant and loving kindness with his, your servants who walk before you with all their hearts. 1 Kings 8.23. This is what we call a definitive statement, right? God, Yahweh, is not one of many or one uh, one amongst a, a group, you know, like you know, the Greeks or, you know, where they have a God for everything. You know, there's one God. There's one supreme ultimate ruler, one deity, one Elohim, you know, one El, as he's called in the Old Testament also, right? So there is one God. So we just said a second ago, Buddha, Allah, anything else you want to throw in there, none of those are gods. They're nothing. They're demons, actually. So that's the truth. <laughs> and so uh, we worship the one true God. So we have to, you know, accept this point that Yahweh's it or none of the rest of our study or any of our time together makes any sense. <laughs> We're just wasting our time. But so <laughs> Yahweh's number one. OK, so who is a God like you who pardons iniquities and passes over the disobedience of the remnant of his heritage? He doesn't retain his anger forever because he delights in loving kindness. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot, and you will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. You will give truth to Jacob and to mercy to Abraham as you have sworn to our fathers from the days of old. Micah 7, 10, I mean 18 through 20. And so here again, it was like, God, there's no one like him. There's no God, first of all, who created everything. There's no one... No God that can wink at your sin because of what Jesus did for you to save your soul. And so, and as we talked a lot about in the Sabbath, that God's creative power was the definitive statement on who's God. Because God re repeatedly refers back to it in the Old Testament. Who created this? Who made this? Who created all things? That's what he keeps doing. Like, I made all this, guys. I'm the one. Okay. And so our God who created all this wants to keep his creation. He wants those ones that were made in his image. Just me and you, right? And so he wants to redeem us back to himself, even though things have played out the way they have. He has made a path, right? And so this is what makes our God special. And so uh, if you do a comparative religion, right, like in Islam, you have to earn your way to their God, right? That's why they're so willing to commit suicide and do heinous acts to innocent people, right? There is no savior. There is no Jesus type figure. Now, they believe in the Mahdi that will become, but it's like an iron fist type thing. And so, but, uh, and so what we have in Christ Jesus, which is so different than every other religion on the face of the planet, where our God sent his son to die for our sins, he made the path, he dropped the rope, he gave us the ladder. All other religions make you create your own ladder, build your own rope, and find your own way, right? And that's what makes our God super special. So uh, let's keep going. Preserve my soul, for I am godly. You, my God, save your servant who trusts in you. Be merciful to me, Lord, for I call to you all day long. Bring joy to the soul of your servant. For to you, Lord, to lift, do I lift my soul. For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive, abundant in loving kindness to all those who call on you. Hear, Yahweh, my prayer. Listen to the voice of my petition. In the day of my trouble, I will call on you, for you will answer me. There is no one like you among the gods. Lord, nor any deeds like your deeds. All nations 
nations you have made will come and worship before you, Lord. They shall glorify your name, for you are great and do wonder, wondrous things. You are God alone. Teach me your way, Yahweh. I will walk in your truth. Make my heart undivided to fear your name. I will praise you, Lord my God, with my whole heart. I will glorify your name forevermore, for your loving kindness is great towards me. You have delivered my soul from the lo lowest shale or hell. Psalms 86, 2 through 13. So again, here we go. You're it, God. I mean, we got three great ver uh, sections of verses saying you're alone. Yahweh's it. There's none like you. There's no one else to ask help from. There's no one that has the power you have, right? This is the God we serve. And this is important for us because as we continue in this study, we understand that the power is given to Jesus, right? And then Jesus gives it to us. So if we just follow that uh, train of thought backwards if we get it from jesus who did jesus get it from jesus says he got it from the father okay well who the father who is the father well the father is yahweh and yahweh makes definitive claims guys i'm it you know there's no other way there is no god like me there's nothing in the entire you know seen and unseen realm that compares to me right. you know and so praise god for that okay <laughs> so now that we have this ultimate superpower god that is there's none like him he's the cream of the crop right He's the El Jefe. Uh, <laughs> it's fun. Uh, okay. So God has hidden your sins in Jesus. So God no longer sees you as you were, but as a little Jesus. Here we go. It says, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, our life, is revealed, then you will also be, able to be revealed with him in glory. Colossians 3, 3 through 4. So what did God do in order, because he's not going to change who he is. He can't make himself sinful enough to be in your presence. Mm -hmm. He has to make you righteous enough to be in his, right? right? Because he's not going to stop being God. So he had one option. You see, I'm going to have to redeem them back to me, give them away to make them like me because I cannot become sinful like them, right? Because right. God cannot sin. And so well, he did this by hiding all of our failure, all of our junk, all of our sin in Christ Jesus. Right, and that is the beautiful thing. So that all power, ultimate God of the entire universe goes. I love my creation. I made him in my image. How do I keep them? And he goes. Here's how I keep them. I send my son. He dies on the cross. He resurrects again. And all those who have faith in him and what he did for them will receive salvation. And so my brother, talking to my brother, uh, he's like, "Well, I don't think it's fair. I wasn't there when Adam and Eve sinned. Why do I have to pay for their sins?" I was like, "That's a good point." But you weren't there when Jesus died on the cross either, when he paid for your sins. Mm -hmm. So there you go. You weren't at either one. You weren't there when sin came in the world. You weren't there when sin was defeated. All you have to do now is decide, do you take the, the, the escape hatch, the way out? Do you take the way that God has provided for you to get out of this mess? So, yep, you weren't there when Adam and Eve sinned. You weren't there when Jesus died for those sins. All you have to do is go, I follow first Adam or I follow second Adam, which is Jesus. If you follow second Adam, you're good. God has given you salvation. Now obey him, okay? So, next one. You are the children of God. See what sort of love the Father has given to us that we should be called God's children. And indeed we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Dear friends, we are God's children now. That will be as he... Uh, and what we will be has not yet been revealed. We know that whatever, uh, whenever it is revealed, we'll be like him because we will see him just as he is. First John 3, 1 through 2. I wrote a whole book on this verse. We shall be like him.com. Download it. It's free. So, uh, and it's weird because that book is a powerful verse. That book is 100,000 words to, to explain one Bible verse. I mean, it's ridiculous. So if you really want to know what that means... It's in that book. It took 100,000 words. So it's a power-packed verse to really get into. And so we have a better hope. Just like those who follow after Adam, they're going to get Adam's punishment. They're, they're, if they want to follow after Adam's sin, they get burned up. They can't be in God's presence. Those who want to follow after Jesus gets Jesus' reward. Yeah. You know, And then we get exalted with him. right? And so none of us have received the fulfillment of this... Uh, blessing it. We receive a down payment in the Holy Spirit, right? It's earnest money. Like when you're buying a house and you put down a thousand dollars on something, I want this house. That's what the Holy Spirit is. It's earnest money on our lives from God. Like they're mine. 
we're, until the day of redemption, mm-hmm. you know, because Paul says that it hadn't come yet because we're, we're not immortal mm-hmm. yet. You know, we haven't thrown off our sin completely, you know, and so we look forward to that day. OK, so let's go to the top of page three. It says, Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. How many? Every. (laughs) In the heavenly realm in Christ. For he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. He did this by predestining us to the adoption as his legal heirs through Jesus Christ, according to the pleasure of his will, to the praise and the glory of his grace, that he has freely bestowed on us his dearly loved Son. Ephesians 1, 3 through 6. So every or all, which we've talked about in the part, this is, those are big words. Every, all. Like, how much pizza can I have? You could have every slice, <laughs> right? That means everything, right? And so he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, right? And so I, my devotions this morning, it says <laughs> earthly riches is not how much stuff you have, right? Like the riches of heaven, the riches that matter, What you have is who you are in Jesus. Those are the riches of heaven, right? And so we can be filthy, stinking rich in the things of God and in the spiritual realm, but have very low means on this face of the planet. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, is those earthly riches will burn up. Those heavenly riches go before you into your to their day of redemption, and you'll have those forever. You know, and so we want to be rich in the things of Yahweh. If He makes us rich in the things of the world because of it, then so be it. Praise God for that. If not, don't worry about it. Move on. Right? The thing is, is God is more concerned about your salvation and then your bank account. That's right. You know, and so He is concerned about your bank account. Believe me, He is. He wants to take care of you. But at the same time, number one concern is keeping you with Him. Right? Okay. So let's keep going. Uh, For you were once darkness, but are now light in the world. Walk as children of light for the fruits of the spirit and all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is well pleasing to the Lord. Ephesians 5, 8 through 10. Right. So we have the almighty God, most powerful. He has made a way through his son to redeem us. We are now children of God. Right. And so what is he saying? He says, you were once children of darkness. Now you're children of light. Act like it. Amen. Right? That's right. Right. So like if you were like were a pauper and the king comes and goes, now you're a royal prince of my court and he brings you into the kingdom and brings you into the throne room and you're hanging out with him, but you're still going through the halls begging for food. <laughs> right. You're like walking around in your dirty, stinky clothes, mm-hmm. not really catching the clue in your brain that you're now a prince. You have more than this now. Right? right. And so people do this spiritually. They become a Christian, but they still act like they're, yeah, in the world, destitute, down, spiritually paupers, like poor people, mm-hmm. you know, spiritually poor. And so once we become children of God, we have to act like we're rich, think like we're rich in Jesus Christ. Not earthly riches, spiritual riches, mm-hmm. right? Understand our standing, understanding what God is doing in our behalf, right? Mm-hmm. And harness all those every blessings that we talked about, everything, every spiritual blessing, you know, and all the good things. So uh, let's keep going. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are no longer slaves, right? But sons, and if sons, heirs of God through Christ. And because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer slaves, but a son. If you are a son, then you're also an heir through God. Galatians 4, 6 through 7. That's what I just talked about. You've just been moved in, man. You've been adopted. You're part of the crew. You know, you have standing. We talked about that a couple weeks ago, how my children have standing in my house. Yeah. You know, they are my children. They don't have to beg for food in my house. It's their house. They want to make a mess in the living room, play with the toys or require of us something. Well, they're my kids. That's part of it, you know. And so, like, my kids should never feel. And, like, here's my thing. I tell my kids they never have to leave. They don't have to move out. People are like, I can't wait till my kids are 18. I'm like, well, yeah, well, if they want to move out, they can. If they don't, I don't care. They're so a part of my fabric that, like, I, I'm good either way, you know. And so you're welcome to stay. You're welcome to go. You want to put a house in the front yard? That's cool with me, too. I don't care. You're mine, you know. And it's going to be stay that way. Okay. So we are not slaves, right? We are not, like, under this taskmaster of sin and Satan in the world. We talked a lot about that, about the Sabbath, about how that breaks the burden of the world. That when we keep Sabbath and we tell our jobs, no, we can't and stuff, we're reclaiming back to ourselves right. our freedom in Christ Jesus. That's right. right. We are putting up a barrier saying, you guys don't get to cross this line. 
time. I'm not going to travel and seek, you know, mammon and money over spending time with God, okay? And that's what's sad with But also, spiritually, we could do it in other ways, right? We don't have to be burdened by the things of the world or what the world desires or think are supreme. Not that they're not important. It's nice to have nice things, nice house, nice clothes, that kind of stuff. This It's great. Those are blessings or to be entertained or anything like that. But we have to just put them in the right pecking order, right? We have to put them in the right place, okay? And so as long as we do that, we'll be fine and we can enjoy these things that won't harm our soul. So you... Yeah, so you are a citizen in God's kingdom. Give thanks to the Father who made us fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints and lights who delivered us out of the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of the Son of his love in whom you, we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. Colossians 1, 12 through 14, right? So you're citizens, all right? We're hammering this home. God's ultimate. He forgives you of your sins through Jesus. You're now an heir. You're a citizen. Everybody understands what that means. It's Americans or whatever country you may reside. You are a citizen in that you have privileges and you have guidelines. Everybody talks about American freedom. We have freedom in America. Does that mean America doesn't have laws? No. So we have freedom in Christ Jesus. Does that mean Christ Jesus and God don't have laws? No. Come on now. And so what are laws? Good, just, moral, constitutional laws in America protect the individual from the government and from their fellow man if they get out of hand. That's what good laws do, right? And so that's what the Ten Commandments do for us. It protects us from hurting one another and keeping our relationship with God supreme, okay? And so these are good things. These are what we do in the kingdom. And so what happens is when people become Christians, they, you know, when you go to a foreign country and you try to go, like say you wanted to go into Brazil, right? And so you're you're trying to bring fruit and stuff into Brazil and that's a no-no. And so you get you go through what is called customs, right? And when you go through customs, what do you have? You have to itemize all your junk. They're going to look over your list. Yes, yes, no, no. And then you throw this away. Sorry, you can't have that, right? So most Christians get stuck in customs. They get stuck in customs with God. What can I bring? Can't I bring all my sin with me? No, you can bring none of it. Can't I bring this? They get so bum fuzzled about trying to give up stuff and get there. They never leave customs, right? They're just still trying to figure out what I can get away with. How do I get everything? I want salvation. I want your blessings, but I want my sin. And I want, no, you just have to go, okay, this is God customs into God's kingdom. He says, leave it all behind. That's right. Just drop it. Follow me. I got better things in in my kingdom. I will give you back the things you give up for me in my kingdom. And then you'll have them forever. Okay. And so we have to don't, let's not get stuck in customs with God. Let's just go ahead and, you know, drop it all, you know, bring on a carry on with your Bible and then call it good. Okay. And so we are heirs to the kingdom of God. Uh, listen, my brothers and sisters, do not, uh, did not God choose the poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? James 2, 5. What is the qualifying statement? Mm-hmm. What is the qualifying statement to those who love him? So these people think everybody's making it. No, those who love him make it. Those who are called make it. We're going to be talking about that in maybe next week or week after that. But, you know, and so those who are called, those who love, those who respond, they're the ones that get to make it to heaven, okay? And so we want to love him. How does the Bible say? say, if you love me, keep my commandments, right? So that's how we know how to love God is we obey, okay? All things belong to you. Therefore, let no one boast in man, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come. All are yours, and you are Christ, and Christ is God's. 1 Corinthians 3, 21 through 23. So all things belong to you. So the great trick we have to do here, guys, is we have to allow ourselves to be convinced that what we don't see right now, and that's why it's faith, we haven't seen the, the promised land yet, that it's all ours though, right? God is saying, trust me. There's enough proof that he's existing because we're alive. We see the beauty. We see the complexity. We see how it all works together. We see that we're at the right distance from the sun, not to die from it. You know, we see all these things. And so we know that God exists. Creation declares his glory, right? And and, and so the Bible says even a fool or an unbeliever can look at creation and know that God exists, right? So it declares his existence okay yeah. so he's saying you can see all this he says there's another one beyond this there's a kingdom right there's something greater coming right and he's saying all of what i have in store for you is yours and a lot of it will look a lot like this because the new heavens and a new earth right and so he'll make a new eden basically and so we have to be convinced we have to be like so dead set convinced that that's true and that's real and that we can trust him 
And then we will be willing to take the sacrifices, to take the hits, to lose the promotion, to get mocked or get persecuted, you know, to do the things that please him, you know, because we will be so convinced on who he is, that he's trustworthy, that he is right, and that he has something better. So for a Christian, you never are going to get less uh, less back than you put in. Because that's why Jesus said, a hundredfold press down, overflowing this life and the next, right? And so anything you give, God is going to double up on you. You're going to get a hundredfold back in one way or the other, okay? This life and the next. And so we have to have a, a profound confidence in that statement, right? And if we can just look at it, that's why I, you know, I told you guys I read the Voice of the Martyrs devotional every morning, you know? And so, um, I, and every day it just reminds me, these, it's, all it is is about people who get martyred for their faith mm -hmm. and their stories and what they're willing to give up. You know, and it, I mean, it's moving most of the time because you just, it helps you realize that there's more to it than America. Mm -hmm. That Christianity is an Amer isn't an American-centric thing. It's a worldwide thing, and there's many Christians out there suffering and dying and paying a cost that we in America don't get to. We're fat and sassy. Mm -hmm. You know, like me, I walk around like a billboard. I got my shirt on, I got my thing on, I got it's all over my car. People look at me weird. And the, and it's not even, like it feels like persecution at times, but it's not even near persecution, you know, because you do that like in India and stuff, they'll firebomb your car and burn you, you know. So it's like, but in America, Christians can't even do that. They're so afraid of being made fun of or looked at. Like I saw, uh, and I don't mean to point out anybody, so I'll just say, one of the people I saw that helped lead me to Christ when I was about 15, I saw them, you know, and his his car drove past my mine the other day and I waved and stuff, you know, and I was like, wow, I bet he saw what was on my car. Awesome. You know, and I looked at his car and there was nothing. I'm like, not that he has to be like me, but isn't that a missed opportunity? You're like our cars, we're driving around 24 7 all the time, moving billboards. People are sitting in parking lots just staring at your stuff. Right? Isn't that a missed opportunity not to present some form of the gospel? That's a missed opportunity. And so, but most Christians won't even do that, you know, because they don't want to be targeted, you know? And so, when ISIS was big, they were telling them, well, don't military, don't put stuff on your car, they might target you Christians, you know? I'm like, well, who cares? The Bible says don't seek to save your life. You seek to save your life, you'll lose it. If you're willing to lose your life, you'll gain it, right? But see, what would happen if all 70% of America who all claim to be Christian all of a sudden started doing things to be more outward focused with their walk with God? Wearing shirts, wearing hats, handing out tracts, putting stuff on their car. What would happen? I mean, I could imagine a great revival, right? But so everybody's so afraid. They fear the world more than they fear God. They fear being targeted more than they fear disappointing God, right? And not exalting his name like they should. So I encourage every single one of us, find new ways to spread the gospel because, guys, it's getting short. We want to be caught working when Jesus comes back, right? We don't want to be, like, cowering in a corner hiding out of fear, and then you'd be like, what have you done for me, servant? And you're like, well, I hid. <laughs> it's getting rough out there, God. You know? No. I'd be like, you know, let's go do it. Let's throw down spiritually, man. Let's get it done. You know? Because who cares? If we truly believe what's coming is better, then we'll invest in it. And how do we invest in it? We open our mouths. We get online. We get on Facebook and YouTube and get out in the world and start spreading the truth, right? Because, listen, somebody did it to save your soul. How selfish would it be for us not to do it to help save somebody else's soul? It'd be like saying, you know, oh, I got mine. I'm going to go hide out now. I mean, it's, we don't want to do that. It's like me giving every one of you guys a million dollars. I'm be like, listen, guys, here's a million dollars. You're like, Lance, you're the greatest guy ever. Thanks, dude. And I'll be like, yes, I am. Right? Now go tell somebody else I'll give them a million dollars. You were like, no, I'm going to Haiti and I'm going to hide. I'm like, well, that's not the plan, dude. <laughs> the plan is I give you a million, you find somebody else to give a million, and we keep giving out millions until everybody's a millionaire, right? And so how do we all become millionaires? We become millionaires through Christ Jesus, spiritually speaking, right? And so God has given every one of us salvation, right? And so we all need to be out helping other people get salvation. That is the whole point. Like we talked last week, the Great Commission is not a suggestion, it was a command from Jesus Christ. Go and make disciples. Go do this. Most Christians treat, treat church like it's a country club, right? Where they go and pay their money, get their needs met, go about their day. Oh, I feel good about myself. Well, good for you. Selfish, selfish, selfish. Why don't you get off your butt and do something for somebody else? 
right? And that's how you have a vibrant walk with God is once you start spreading the gospel, finding different ways. And everybody can do it different ways. No, you don't have to be like me. You can do it other ways, right? Even just posting Bible verses or uh, saying God bless you to people or asking people if they need prayer. There's a million different ways to do it, right? And so we all do it differently. My wife just could not do what I do. Not in, not in singles. No, she's not capable of it. She is not geared that way. But she finds other ways, to bless people and to be a light and to share the gospel, right? So we all have to find the way God allows us to do it, right? And if we could do that, I'm telling you guys, good things are going to happen for you, I promise. Okay, next, move on. And that goes beautifully to what we're heading into here. Statement of authority, bottom of page three. Uh, Jesus, it says, bottom of page three, uh, it says, Jesus, all power is given to Jesus from God Almighty. So we talked about how God is ultimate, right? He's the big kahuna, the El Jefe, you know, president-elect. And uh, so all power is given to him. It says, Then Jesus came up and said to them, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Matthew 28, 18. Right. So what do we have here? All power has been given to me. That's a, that's a, a declaration. Like, listen, guys, I got it all. Okay, how much is all? All is all again, right? I have all authority. Right. Okay. So let's read. It says, All principalities, powers, might, and dominion, with every name that is named, is placed under the feet of Jesus. Let's read. Top of page four. Um, give you a second. There you go. This is power he exercised in, in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above every rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one that is to come. God put all things under Christ's feet and gave him to the church as head of, over all things. Now the church is his body, the fullness of him who dwells all in all. Ephesians 1, 20 to 23. Right. So all power has been given to Christ Jesus, right? <clears throat> Why are we focusing on this? Let me get you. So Jesus Christ says, all power is given to me. we got a backup verse. <clears throat> Basically, two witnesses. <clears throat> we got Jesus here saying it. Then we have the disciples saying it. Listen, guys, all power has been given to Christ Jesus. This is important for this next ex uh, statement, okay? We have been given uh, the Great Commission, correct? To go out and make disciples of all men, uh, baptizing the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, teaching them to obey whatever he has commanded. That's the Great Commission, right? So there's a great exchange we're about to hear, right? Because Jesus was like, hey, guys, I'm here. The fullness of the Godhead dwells in me bodily. That's what the Bible says. All power was given into him. Right? He had to leave. Okay, so let's read. The great exchange from Jesus to the Holy Spirit. Okay, Jesus is talking here. You're very sad from hearing all of this, but I tell you that I'm going to do what is best for you. This is why I'm going the way. The Holy Spirit cannot come to help you until I leave, but after I'm gone, I will send the Spirit to you. The Spirit will come and show the people of this world the truth about sin and God's justice and the judgment. The Spirit will show them that they are wrong about sin because they didn't have faith in me. They were wrong about God's justice because I'm going to the Father and you won't see me again. And they were wrong about the judgment because God has already judged the ruler of this world. I have much more to say to you, but right now it would be uh, more than you could understand. The Spirit shows what is true and will come and guide you into all into the full truth. The Spirit doesn't speak on his own. He will tell you only what he has heard from me. And he will let you uh, know what is going to happen. The Spirit will bring glory to me by taking my message and telling it to you. Everything that the Father has my, is mine. This is why I said that the Spirit takes my message and tells it to you. John 16, 6-15. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so Jesus accomplished the beautiful work of obeying, G of God, obeying God was sinless. Died on the cross, right? And then was resurrected again, a proof, and proving to us of God's resurrection power, right? And so now he re he's up and he's like, listen, guys, and this, this statement was before then, but he was like basically going, um, listen, it's not good that I stay. You want me to stay, but something greater is coming, right? And so now we have the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. This is why I said earlier was the earnest money, the down payment on your redemption. This is proof that you are God's, right? And as we know in previous Bible studies, it is given to those who obey him. Right, and so the Holy Spirit is given to those who will obey. So let's read. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our witness that we are the children of God, right? For you did not receive the spirit of slavery leading again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness to our spirit that we are God's children. And if the children that heirs, namely the heirs of God and also fellow heirs with Christ, if 
Indeed, we suffer with him, so may we also be glorified with him. Romans 8, 15 through 17. It's a puzzling last statement. If indeed we suffer with him, we'll also be glorified with him. What does that mean? Okay, so we've talked a lot about becoming the children of God, right? So we know this, this is it. We've been adopted, Abba Father. So that last statement is what we need to focus on. If indeed we suffer with him, we'll also be glorified in him, right? So that means, what does that mean? So Jesus says, in this life, you know, you'll have tribulation. Right, the Bible says all the and live godly will suffer persecution. Right, and so that's what that means. That means you have to be willing, like Jesus said, that you must deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow Him. That's what it takes. Right, it doesn't mean we don't accomplish things in life. It just means we have to put that first foremost. That's our number one task. Number one, most people feel like it's their job. Like I have to go to work every day. That's task number one. No, it's not task number one. Task number one is putting God first, doing what pleases Him, mm-hmm. and we have to get it in the right order to accomplish the goal effectively. Right. So we have to suffer. It doesn't mean we all suffer in the same way or the same degree. Right. It just means we have to be like not a fe- fearful of it. I have on my bookcase at home. I wrote. And, and red marker across my bookcase, it says, embrace the battle like it's your birthright, That's because right. it is, right? Mm-hmm. And so that battle is what we're made for. We're made to go out and face and endure and accomplish for Jesus Christ and God. That's our whole existence, right? And so most Christians now want to go, I want to go hide away and keep it to myself and, you know, and that kind of stuff. Well, that's not what you're built for, right? We're all soldiers for Jesus Christ and for Yahweh and Yeshua. And so that's why it says, you know, the soldier obeys his, his commanding officers that he may please him, right? Mm-hmm. So when we go out into the world, our number one thing is that, listen, I am here as a conquering servant for Jesus Christ, pushing back the forces of darkness to bring his children home. All right, that's all of our roles. Now, we play it out differently. We have different aspects of the body of Christ. All are important, you know, but that's all of our goals. That's all of our, that's the, the reason why you exist. When you accepted Jesus Christ, you got drafted. You're in the, in, in, you know, the army now, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like a song, on, Onward Christian Soldier. <clears throat> Amen. Let me get a drink. Mm. We have a question. Angel has a question, then anybody else have questions? Go ahead. So that also means suffering in the flesh as well. Yeah, sometimes. Suffering in relationships, persecution through relationships, yeah. persecution in your flesh. Right. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Definitely. So she basically physical, mental, spiritual persecutions. Yeah. Adam, you got something? Well, kind of, sort of. Earlier, you're reading that... Uh, God has already said he had already judged the ruler of this world. Satan, yeah. Yes. And that's what I was going to naturally assume, that it was Satan and not like just a man yeah. ruler. Right, yeah. Right, because uh, in the Bible, Satan is called the God of the earth, or God of this earth, you know, in the New right. Testament. Yeah, so he was judged. He was defeated. So he, he took back the, the keys of death and hell, you know. And so, yeah, he's uh, Satan's kind of rendered impotent in a lot of ways now because of that. You know, and so as Christians, we are mightier in Christ Jesus than the people were before, right? So we have more authority now in Christ Jesus because of it. So, yeah. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, praise God. Uh, we just read four. Okay. Uh, the whole, bottom of page four. The Holy Spirit dwells in us, and we are the temple of God. Do you not know that you are God's temple, that God's Spirit lives in you? If someone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy, which is what you are. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 through 17, right? We talked about this a lot, about the Sabbath, about how the new covenant is, I will write the law upon their hearts, right? There's not an absence of law in the new covenant. It's now it's reading inside of you. We talked about how your heart is the Ark of the Covenant, because the Ark contained the law. Right? And so you're the temple of God. You're the Ark of the Covenant. You have the law written upon your hearts. These are the things that God has made you, right? And so we talked about previously if you're God and you can do anything, how do you make a building special enough for you to dwell in? You're God. You don't need a building special enough to dwell in, right? So what does he do? He decides to dwell in his creation, those who can love him back and can make decisions and operate. So the flesh is what, you know, spiritually speaking, he wanted to dwell in you. Right. And so this flesh hasn't been renewed yet, but one day it will, you know, and so praise God for that. And then we'll dwell in his presence forever. So let's remember, guys, that while you're out and you're tempted to sin like we all are, 
that you are the temple of God, that God is dwelling in you, that he is with you, he is watching, and he wants you to do the right thing, right? Okay, so let's keep going. Holy Spirit requires supremacy in the temple of God. That's the bottom of page four. It says, what agreement has a temple of God with idols? For you are a temple of the living God, even as God said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God, and they will be my people. Top of page five. Therefore, come out of uh, from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing. I will receive you. I will be to you a father, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. 2 Corinthians 6, 16 through 18, right? And so the Holy Spirit requires supremacy in your life. It's not going to sit there and do a timeshare in your heart and your mind, right? That So when we do that to the Holy Spirit, that's when we grieve the Holy Spirit. And so if we're like, I'm going to give God everything but this one thing, right? Whatever that is. Like, I still want to go and have adulterous relationships or break Sabbath or something like that. You know, and so you're like, you can have everything but, mm-hmm. right? So that's grieving the Holy Spirit, right? And so... You can't do that with the God and expect his best. You can't do that with God and expect all of his blessings. You can't do that with God or anybody else like your wife or your husband or whatever and expect a good relationship because you're in a covenant agreement to provide and do certain things. Right. right. And so we're in a covenant agreement to obey him, to do what he says, to realize we are not our own. We have been bought with our price, right? That we must obey, right? He is in agreement. And what's his side of agreement? I will save your soul. I will look after you. I will provide for all your needs. I will be here when you need me. And in times of trouble, I will save you from that. Okay. There's an agreement. There you go. Boom. Right. And just like with Abraham, he's like, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. Right. And just do what I say. What did Abraham have to do? Abraham was like, okay, leave your homeland. Let's walk. You know, where's your son? Yeah, we're going to kill him. No, I and mean, then Abraham went through, but he didn't have to, right? And so what, amen. amen. Yeah. And so what we find here with God is a covenant relationship. Well, we, both parties have something to bring to the table, right? And so modern Christianity teaches that, you know, you're a giant bucket and, and God's candy man just throwing candy your way and you just can sit there and get it filled. No, and no, that's not that it's not even biblical. It's not even true. So God requires, right? And the Holy Spirit requires supremacy in our hearts, in our minds, in our life. So we have to give that to him to get God's best. Okay. So it says, uh, for all who are led by the spirit of God are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery leading again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father, the spirit himself bears with our spirit that we are God's children. If children, the heirs, name the heirs of God, also fellow heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, so we may also be glorified him with him. Romans 8, 14 through 17. So it's the longer version, right? And so just another verse to kind of expand and repeat. But the thing is, guys, it would be foolish for all of us if, you know, somebody was, you know, invited us into their home, offered to do nice things for us and take care of our needs and deep felt needs and to turn around and slap them in the face and ruin their house, right? We don't do that. So God is no different. So we have to always respond in thinking about how we're always responding. And most people are like, Lance, this just seems like a lot of work and da-da-da-da-da. And I've heard people, mainline ministers said, when I stopped trying to obey God, my walk with God became better. I was like, yeah, because you made it all about you. You're selfish and you're selfish now. Right? It's self-centered. It's very self-centered. So, yes, I'm constantly, believe me, guys, I'm constantly thinking about God. What pleases him? What's the right response? How do I do these things? Mm -hmm. That's called the spirit of self-control that the Holy Spirit gives us, right? We have to always be on guard, right? We always have to be engaged what's going on. Most people just react to life. We can't do that. And I'm a very passionate and, like, I will get it done type of individual. So if I don't keep that in check... Not good things, right? You know, I'm not a person that will just sit back and go, well, no, I'll bust you in the face, you know? And, like, I, so I have to, like, take that and be like, okay, God, I'm I'm having a moment. <laughs> things are about to go sideways here, you know? And so I need to pray and think and talk with God and commune and, you know, but God wants passionate people like that, okay? It's the wallflowers that God has a problem with, you know, because look at all the people in the Old Testament and New Testament, like Paul, 
very passionate individual. Let's go kill them all, God. I'm going to do it in your name. Woohoo! Peter, he was rambunctious and bo boast boastful and, you know, I'll never deny you, you know, conquer, you know. And so if we look at David, I mean, it's just looking at anybody that God really uses in Scripture. It's somebody who's got some fire in their belly. God can take a person with fire in belly and redirect that fire into a, bib a biblical avenue, right? But it's if the it's the wallflowers that people go, eh, whatever, that God has a terrible time using. Complacent. Right, because they're just so complacent. They're so unmoved by anything, right? They have no drive, you know? And so it's good to have drive, and it's good to have, like, a desire to march forward and get things done, right? But at the same time, if you want to just uh, uh, ride the pew all the way to heaven, you know, you know, well, you ain't going to go. I promise you that, you know? Be like, how can you say that, Lance? I was like, first of all, faith takes action. If you ain't in action, then I don't say you have any faith. You know, your lack of anything will judge you on that day. Right. And so faith compels us to perform. It compels us to change our lifestyle. It compels us to do things differently. It compels us to put God first. Right. It compels us to do all these things. It has to. It's the whole point. Right. Because Jesus is not just saving us in our sins, but from our sins. Right. It'd be horrible if God was like, hey, guys, yeah, uh, you're a sinful. You like to murder people. You like to hurt people. You can keep doing that. I'm still going to save your soul. What kind of parent would do that to their children? Right. Let them continue on abusive behavior that's going to harm them very badly, right? If As a parent, I'm like, no, you get back here. You stop that. You don't hurt your brothers and sisters. Don't play with fire. You know, that kind of stuff, you know, because that's loving. You don't want to just watch people damage and destroy themselves, right? So that's what God's doing. God's like, come on, let's stop that. We're done with this now, okay? Don't make me spank you. I'll send you to your room. No. <laughs> uh, okay, so let me get a drink. I think Chad left us. He had to go. Lunchtime. Okay. Uh, you uh, says you have been given powerful gifts. Use them. All right. So here's the, the wonderful things of the Holy Spirit. God has set some in the assembly, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracle workers, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, and various kinds of languages. 1 Corinthians 12, 28. Or speaking in tongues. Uh, so there's one. So let's read the next one. Now there are different gifts, but the same spirit. And there are different ministries, but the same Lord. And there are different results, but the same God who produces all of them and everyone. To each person, the manifestation of the spirit is given from the benefit of all. For one person is given through the spirit, the message of wisdom. Another, the message of knowledge, according to the same spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit. And to another, gifts of healing by uh, the one spirit. To another, the performance of miracles. And to another, prophecy. And to another, discernment of the spirits. To another, different type, kinds of tongues or speaking in tongues. And to another, the interpretation of those tongues. It is one and the same spirit distri uh, distributing as he decides to each person who produces all things. All these things. First Corinthians 12, 4 through 12. Or 4 through 11, sorry. And so those, it's, people get hung up on this list. Like Paul and his list. Paul was really good at making lists. It doesn't mean it's the end all be all list. Like there's not more gifts than that. There are more gifts than that, right? And so we can easily prove there's more gifts than that. Because if we look in the Old Testament, God gave people uh, uh, the gift of spiritual gift of craftsmanship to build his temple. Right? It said the Spirit of God came upon him so they could perform and build, right? So we know this isn't the definitive list. This is like, well, these are just all the gifts. No, there's more gifts. These are the ones he's presenting to us because he's making a point, okay? And so we don't get hung up on the list. The list is there to set an example, okay? And so, and there's other gifts we can find in the Old Testament too. But um, uh, so just know we have all been equipped in very special and different ways, by God, right? And those gifts are meant to be used to the spreading of the gospel. If we can use those to spread to the gospel, our gifts get stronger. If we fail to use them, they get weaker, right? And so, like, I've been teaching Bible now since I was, what, 18, 16, 18, right? And so, because I kept going at it, I'm better at it. I All this becomes easier, right? Because I've become more in, uh, proficient and blessed in it because I've been exercising the gift, Right, just like speaking in tongues or prophecy or healing people and stuff, you have to exercise the gifts, right? You have to put them to use mm -hmm. to get better at it and to understand it more, right? It's not like, like you just don't get like this here's 100% everything, right? No, it takes obedience and a lifelong walk to work in those gifts, right. right? And so we have to get whatever those gifts are, get into it and start working at it. And don't be afraid of failure. Mm -hmm. Like praying for people's healings, a lot of people don't do it because they're afraid of failure. 
Well, it's not all about us. Right, exactly. Who cares? We're just a conduit for that. We're, we're the laying on of hands or we're the spirit right. for that person. Right. And so don't be afraid about failing or if it doesn't happen this one time or the next time or casting out demons. I've cast out a lot of demons, a lot of people. Sometimes nothing happens. Mm hmm Right? Do I go, well, I'm, I'm done. It didn't happen. Because I, people like to hang on to those demons. Right. Yeah, well, exactly. Well, even if it was me, who cares? Mm -hmm. You know, like if I failed somehow or I wasn't right with God or, you know, or some kind of thing. The thing is, we can't let fear of failure stop us from trying. Exactly. You know, and stepping out in faith. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody mocks Peter because he stepped out on the water and fell in the water. Well, he's the only one that got out of the boat. I mean, he's the only one taking the risk. It's easy to sit in the boat and go, oh, no, ha, ha, yeah, hi, Jesus. And, and Peter took this step. He's like, call me out, Lord. And so, yeah, he got out. Did he walk on water? Yes, he did. He absolutely walked on water. <laughs> did he eventually fall into that water? Yeah, he did that too. But let's see. So out of the disciples, only one disciple ever got to walk on water. It's the one who tried. Mm -hmm. Don't be the other disciples hanging out in the boat, fear of failure. Right. Be the disciple who's OK. I might fail at this, but I'm going to give it a go. Right. Because I'm going to just get out there and get it done and do it. Right. And that's why we have to be. We have to just go, you know, I don't like this. I want to try, you know, and that's what this ministry is like. We might crash and burn completely. But, you know, at least it was because I tried, not because I don't want to fail because I didn't try. I'd rather fail because I tried. And so if you ask like, yeah. Uh, a lot of real famous people with businesses or, you know, you know, inventors and stuff like that. Like I think uh, Steve Harvey, he, he said a thing on the radio once. He said, everybody thinks he's a success, right, because of his shows. And I might, I might get this number right, but I'm pretty sure this is an accurate number, okay? Mm -hmm. He said that he pitched over 200 shows to television, and five of them got taken, right? Mm -hmm. So if you... As a wow. as an uh, entertainer has to, and he's a name, mm -hmm. can pitch even a hundred shows. How many people would just get discouraged and quit mm -hmm. and say no? It's the people that just keep trying. They're like, I don't care. I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try. I'm gonna just keep trying. Mm -hmm. And one day this hits. So like Thomas Edison and all these other inventors and stuff. That's what they did. They didn't fear the failure. You know, That's right. and so we just have to keep trying in Christ Jesus. <laughs> Those that believe in Jesus will do the same works as he did and even greater. Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I tell you, I speak not for myself, but the Father who lives in me does his work. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me or else believe me for the works sake. Most certainly, I tell you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And he will do greater or more in number works than these, because I am going to my Father. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. John 14, 10 through 14, right? And so, be it more crazier, like, you know, making moons fall out of the sky or more in number. Either way, Jesus is saying, like, listen, guys, this is not an abnormal thing. In the spirit realm with God and Jesus, this is a normal activity. Spiritual gifts, healing, tongues, prophecy, wisdom, knowledge, you know, uh, these are normal things, right? And so I it took me a long time to figure out one of my gifts, which I don't want to talk on the thing. I might After this, I'll tell you guys what it is because I don't want it on YouTube because uh, we were like, you're nuts, but uh, I'll tell you afterwards. But, you know, it took a while of understanding what that gift was, what how it applied, and what to do with it, right? And so just because we're given gifts doesn't mean we're always understanding of how to use those gifts. Right. Or like if God gives us dreams or visions, it doesn't mean we're immediately supposed to tell everybody, so right? If giving a kid a, a crayon or a pencil, he can draw <laughs> He might be a great artist. Right. But he's got to learn the skills first. Right. And so I know exactly. And so I know the Bible very well. And so I have like conversations with you guys or conversations with people. I can't sit around and correct everybody all day long. Nobody would want to talk to me. So I might be in my head going, well, that's not what the Bible says, but I'm not going to sit here and like be that guy. Mm -hmm. Because first of all, you shut people down. Mm -hmm. right and so you can't shut people down i had to learn that you can't just be like well that's not what it says no nope, that's wrong too no nope, why you keep talking <laughs> you should stop you're wrong again you know you can't do that and so you just listen and you you listen to what people think and feel and then you try to 
by the guidance of the Holy Spirit, pick out the ones that really mattered that need to be tackled first. Mm-hmm. Right. And Jesus was really good at this. He was like, you know, if I can't tell you of earthly things, how can I tell you of heavenly things? And that verse we just read, you guys can't understand what I'm about to tell you. Mm-hmm. So I'm not going to tell you. Right. And so that was me learning how to walk in what God has given me. Mm-hmm. Right. And so just because I can walk around and beat people on the head with it, you know, it doesn't mean it's productive. It doesn't mean it gives God any glory. It doesn't mean that I'm using it correctly. It's actually an abuse. Right. So you have to have discernment in order to how to use your gifts. You know, if you have dreams or visions or speaking in tongues, your, your, your tongue might be powerful and mighty. But the thing is, if it offends the person and does them no good, what's the point? You know, and so you have to understand when and how to operate, when to use it, when to share and when not to share. Like on this computer right now, I have Bible studies that I don't know if I'll ever show anybody because they are so far out there. Most people are like, you're a lunatic. I'm like, well, no, I could prove what I'm saying in the Bible. But it's 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 like, I don't want to say next level stuff. Jesus was a lunatic. Right. And so it's just stuff that's like, you know, there's base level. Here's like, okay, this is some deep, deep, deep stuff. You know, and so they're mainly for me. You know, and so I make them, I study them. It's, it's interesting to me, but it's not something that I could readily share with the public, yeah. you know, because they can't handle it, you know, and they don't, they have a hard time with obedience, you know, and let alone anything other than that. And so we have gifts. We have to ask for guidance on how to use the gifts and what, when and how to express, when, how to maintain and hold our peace, mm-hmm. you know, and if we do that, we get better at our gifts, you know, but again, don't be fearful of failure. Okay, it's better to step out in faith than to not step at all. Okay, top of page six. Okay, we have been given authority for Christ over demons. It says, Behold, I give you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy. Nothing will in any way hurt you. Nevertheless, don't rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Luke 10, 19 through 20. Right, so here's the thing. Please notice, when is that? That was Luke chapter 10, right? That was before Pentecost. That was before his death and resurrection. Okay? And so, why is this? So, people are like, this is a unique thing, right? Because prophets would have this power in the Old Testament, right? And so, this is a very special moment. So, what happened was, is his authority of his name gives that authority, Most people think that like the power to cast out demons is a gift of the Holy Spirit. It's not. What it is, is an allegiance to the power in the name of Jesus Christ. Right? Now, the Holy Spirit might be involved in the expulsion, but it is the name of Jesus that gives the power. Right? And so when we talked about when you're in line with God, you know, and you have conference, he knows you, you know him, demons go, that name I know, you know, you know Jesus. Okay, I'm out of here. Right. And so what we have here in the Old uh, New Testament, but basically is before the New Testament was written, is that in the name of Jesus Christ, the name above all names, that name has power. It is, yes, expressed in the power of the Holy Spirit, but it's the name itself that is the power. Okay, And so what we have here, we are vessels of the Holy Spirit. So when we say Jesus or if you're in you know, Japan, Yesido, or wherever country you are, it's, they know what reference you're talking about. It's an, an all name. Most people get hung up. Like it has to be Yeshua. No, it doesn't. First of all, there was like, I think three Yeshua's in the new Testament. And then Joshua was Yeshua. Hebrew. Right. Yeah. And so the name Yeshua, yeah, you know, it's like everybody who wants to kill their call in their name, uh, Muhammad. It's like, it doesn't make them Muhammad mm-hmm. just because they have a name. So it's the, when we reference Jesus or Yeshua or Yesodo or whatever name that is that for your country, you know, it's referencing in our hearts and our spirit, Yahweh and Yeshua, Jesus Christ, the son of God, right? And the spirits know it, right? So we don't have to get hung up on like, what's the correct pronunciation? No, it's the allegiance that matters. Right. And so when, when we say this name is above all names, I claim this name to cast you out. Right. And then the Holy Spirit gets to work like they oh, he claimed the name that, that gives us legal authority, legal operating power to take care of this. Right. And so in Luke chapter 10, this is what Jesus did for them. This is before Pentecost, though. Jesus clearly says that the Holy Spirit is in me. I have to leave for you to receive the Holy Spirit. So they're walking around without the fullness of the Holy Spirit, yet casting out demons. How? In his name. 
Right. And so it's the name of Jesus that is powerful. Okay. And so we have to understand. So even those people that want to say spiritual gifts don't operate now, that it was only for this first century church. Well, guess what, guys? Even if that was true, you could still cast out demons. <laughs> Because it's the name of Jesus that has the power to cast out the demons. Mm -hmm. So they get in a circle argument about it. Yes, we know the gifts still remain. But even if they want to say they don't, the name of Jesus is still just as powerful. That's right. Okay? And so uh, Jesus commands us to preach the gospel as the sign of casting out demons in his name so follows that belief. Okay, so here is like after the resurrection, right? And so, for he said to them, go into all the world and preach the good news to the whole creation. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who disbelieves will be condemned. These signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new languages. They will take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it will no way hurt them they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover mark 16 15 through 18 again guys don't get hung up on the list like there's people that get hung up on this list like you know like pentecostals that want to jump around with the snake that's not what he's trying to do here guys he's trying to say listen all power was given to me i give you all power does that sound like everything possible in the world does that sound like an all that doesn't sound like an all. That sounds like a brief understanding. Like, listen, guys, here's some generalities. He's being general. You'll do these. What did he say? You'll do what I did in greater or more. Things that aren't even mentioned here. Right. So that list is just a, it's like Paul's list. It's not the definitive list. Like, it's guiding you towards exactly giving you something to look forward to. Think of it as stair steps. Yes. He's giving you steps. This step here, and just keep walking up. There's more to this, guys. It doesn't end here. We got more, 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 and more, and all and everything. We got all of it. Okay, so God can do. Because look at Paul and Peter and stuff when they had the handkerchiefs, <laughs> you know, or Paul or Peter's shadow would just fall on someone and be yeah. healed. Is that in that list? No, that's not in that list. I don't see that shadow power. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, you know, I do not see holy handkerchiefs. Like <clears throat> shadow, shadow power, right? <laughs> and so we see these lists. People get hung up on this. Don't get hung up on the list. Okay, just understand. Get hung up on the power. Mm -hmm. He's trying to say there's power. The, the, the Holy Spirit provides gifts. Not a, a bazillion gifts. The Holy Spirit provides power. God's name provides power. Jesus' name provides power. Okay, and so what he's trying to say here, guys, is like, listen... You guys, like we talked last time, are the 800-pound gorilla. You guys are the one. They all have faith with God because you have Christ in you and God in you. You are the light of the world. You walk out, you have meaning and purpose in Christ Jesus. It's not meant to give us a big head because the Bible says, what do you have that hasn't been given to you? Don't boast. So I don't boast in my ability to teach or to understand scripture, right? But I boast in Christ Jesus. That's what Paul said. He says, I boast in, the, in Christ and Christ alone. And so that's what we do. We boast in, in, in God, you know? If we boast in anything, we boast like, you know, how great is God? How awesome is Jesus? You see what they did? That's how we boast, okay? But we take joy and pleasure and happiness in being able to participate, right? And so if we do those things, our walk with God becomes powerful, Amen. right? And so we want that. Believe me, guys, you want that. And God needs you to have that. You know, what do you say? That the harvest is great, but the laborers are few? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm calling you out right now, okay? Mm -hmm. I don't mean to be mean to you. How many fulfill what Jesus says? He says, pray that God will send laborers into his field or into the harvest. Do you guys pray every night that God will send laborers into the field? We have to be praying. What does that mean? That Where means that them? God will send his workers out to spread the gospel. I do. Praise God. And so we have to be doing that every night. God, send your workers into your field. Right. And so I do, too. And I hope we all can start doing this because that's what's going to happen. You know what's going to happen? He goes, OK, you go. <laughs> and then you'll be well, like, that's why a lot of people don't pray that. They're afraid they're going to be called out. Or right. Something. Believe me, it's a scary thing. Believe me, it's not. I'm not trying to make it sound easy because it's not. It's a very scary, tough thing. I promise you that, you know, but at the same time, it's a worthwhile endeavor. It's something worth investing in. Because when you give your life to God, you immediately start thinking, what am I going to have to give up? What am I going to lose? What am I going to have to lay down? What am I going to have to walk away from? It's like, I don't want to serve you, but I want to keep this too. Mm -hmm. And so God is breaking that in me. Mm -hmm. I have to be prepared to, for anything and to lose everything. You, we have to because we can't put our confidence in it. But God loves us. We have to trust that his love for us is more sufficient than what we can do for ourselves. Right. You know? So and comforting. Yes. Okay. So let's go. World. Down at the bottom. 
It says, But all things are of God, who are reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not reckoning to them their trespasses or sins, and having committing to us the word of, rec of reconciliation, right? Bringing the two together. We are therefore ambassadors, right? On behalf of Christ, as though God were entreating by us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God, for him who knew no sin had... Uh, he made sin uh, to be sin on our behalf so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5, 18-21. So what we have here, guys, is an ambassador represents a country, right? So America's ambassador goes to Iran, which not is likely to happen anytime soon. <laughs> How about Europe? <laughs> and uh, so he's over there. So what the ambassador says represents the United States. If the ambassador says, yes, we'll do this, or no, we won't do it, it's with the force of the government behind him, mm -hmm. right? And so if the ambassador steps out of line, it puts the country in the bind because he's there with full authority to go, yes, we agree. No, we don't agree. We'll do this. We won't do that, right? So when the Bible says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, mm -hmm. it's because you're an ambassador of God. Right. And so we have to learn what Jesus says. I don't say anything, but unless my father says it, I don't do it unless I see my father doing it. Mm -hmm. We have to be good ambassadors. Right. We can't. A lot of pastors right now are being bad ambassadors. They're trying to say stuff that's not even biblical. Right. And trying to say it's from God, but it's not. And so what we have here is we're ambassadors. We're in this world to fulfill a calling. Right. To be soldiers to go out and redeem and bring people home and help and glorify God. Right. And so we have to remember our role. At all time. And sometimes I forget. Sometimes I joke. Sometimes I, I'm talking to somebody and I let the conversation get away from where it needs to be. Nothing bad, just like pointless, you know. And so I have to constantly like catch myself, you know, because it's, it's an everyday battle. It just doesn't like, oh, I, I have arrived. You know, I am so good and perfect. I, I make no mistakes. You know, it just doesn't happen. You know, so we battle our, our, our natural inclinations in nature every single day we have to we have to get used to it. it's part of our life and our existence right so we can stay lockstep with god okay so chosen out of the world let me take a drink i quite enjoyed this verse and that's why i highlighted it so big it says in the same hour jesus rejoiced in the holy spirit that's something i can think about all day i'm like Okay, how was this exactly accomplished? What was he doing? What was going on? I have all these questions about this, mm -hmm. this verse because, you know, and it's like, so I'm like, so in that same hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit. I'm thinking, man, I wish I could have seen that. I wish I could have been a part of it. I wish I, I don't, I would just love to have like been a fly on the wall to watch him do this, you know? And so it's a powerful thing. And said, I thank you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father. For it was well pleasing in your sight. Turning to the disciples, it said, All things have been delivered to me by my Father. No one knows who... Uh, who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and whomever the Son desires to reveal it to. Luke 10, 21 through 22, right? So we're going to be talking about that concept about being called, being revealed, you know, uh, in the next couple of weeks. Um, so, but I love that verse. It kind of recapitulates. I put this towards the end to help us bridge to the next studies, okay? About being called and Jesus being revealed to people, right? And that only the people that God reveals or calls are allowed to come, okay? Now, most people call this predestination. I like to call it predetermination because let me ask you one real brief, quick question. If God is omnipotent, all-knowing, knows the beginning of heaven, he already knows who's going to go to heaven. He already knows whose name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Right, she said, uh, Lamb's Book of Life, exactly. So there's names written. Well, if there's names written, there's names not written, though. Right? And so this is not an obscure thing. So most people call it Calvinism. I have to just be totally honest to you. You, believe me, I have more than enough verses to prove that Calvinism is more accurate than what most people like to think. Right? <coughs> and so what happens is in Calvinism, I don't want to... I don't want to give away the plot until the next Bible study. Just it's going to be good, and you'll walk away convinced. I promised you that because the Bible is quite clear, right? You know, on the subject. So let's read the last verse. Well, and it's kind of 
in our day and age especially, you can kind of see who is and who isn't. Oh, yeah. I mean, our spirit knows where when we walk up to someone, you can see in their eye. You're right. You know Jesus. Right. Oh, yeah. And it may, they may be another realm of religion as far as man's doctrine. Right. We share the same Lord. Right. They've been called. That's right. <laughs> right. They've been called. I was walking out at Walmart this morning, and this lady was like, Jesus loves you. I was like, thanks. Jesus loves you, too. She's like, I know. And she had a little, like, little lapel pin and stuff. Yeah. I was like, yeah, I can tell, you know, yeah. so, to your point. So last verse, it says, I revealed your name to the people whom you have given me out of the world. That's kind of what we're talking here, guys. They were yours, and you have given them to me. They have kept your word. John 17, 6, right? Amen. And so... <laughs> Coming up, we're going to talk about predetermination pretty soon and uh, and what the Bible has to say about those who are called versus those who aren't called, you know, and what that means and how that all plays out. But here in this, this study, guys, we have to understand our power in Christ Jesus, that we are called into the kingdom, that we are his children. We have been blessed. We have been sanctified. We have been empowered by the Holy Spirit. We are called to go out and do mighty, wonderful things for his name in faithfulness to him. Okay? So if we could do that and understand who we are in Christ Jesus, it'll make us so much more powerful and more willing to obey and not be so willing to sin and turn our backs upon him and, and forfeit a blessing. Okay? <laughs> Any questions before we pray? I love that part though in this scripture. It says, I reveal your name to the people whom you have given me. Right. So we have been given to God. Or right. To Jesus. Amen. Yeah. Given to him. That's right. Praise God. That's right. We are his. Wow. That's all you need in this life is to know you belong to him. Oh, exactly. Praise God. How about you? Okay. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Father, thank you so much for calling us into your kingdom, to giving us to Jesus, to being, being redeemed by him, for giving us the, your Holy Spirit in Christ's name so we can go out and do the things that you'd have us to do and help bring the children home. Uh, we thank you for taking care of us and loving us and empowering us and helping us to know who we are. So we don't have to listen to the lies of this world or to the devil, and we know our self-worth in you. And so we praise you and we thank you for that. We pray for Samson Light, strength and endurance for April, that everything will go well and smooth, and she'll get that job today. And uh, we just thank you for taking care of us and loving us. Help us have a happy Sabbath coming up and a good rest of the week, and thank you for taking care of us. And bless uh, Daniel's doctor's appointment, that everything will go well with his health screening, and that you'll continue to keep him strong to in jesus name we pray amen amen amen, amen. amen. praise god <laughs> praise god. god awesome if you feel so led of the lord and want to know how to donate to this ministry outreach please visit brotherlance.com and scroll down to the bottom of the main page for the paypal link thank you and may god's blessing rest upon you